All right, folks. Welcome back. Glad to have you along for another tutorial in this really long project. But this time we're going to start moving on to building a view client application for managing our user's account information and for managing our authentication. Now this video is optional and it's more catered towards those who are joining in the project who maybe didn't have interest in building the account application in Golang, but are very interested in Vue. If you've been following along to this point, a lot of this will be redundant and your project should already be set up. So today we'll review what we've done and then get those people started who are just joining along. Last time we created this API and just as an example, I have the API running and in Postman, we have some endpoints for an account application. So we have a base URL, slash account and we can sign in for example with a user called bob01 and password and uh, that is invalid because they're not signed up yet so first let's sign up this bob01 they're now signed up and then we can sign them in for example uh, we can do something like get this user's details at a get me endpoint if the user is authorized so let's add some bearer token authorization here and then let's send this request and you see with the authorized user we get their name image url and website what we'll be working on this tutorial is creating this client application to for example either sign up or log in the user there's a little validation error we'll need to fix but it was bob01 at bob.com was the user we just created and we can enter password and log them in and do things like set their name to Bob Beacons. <laughs> All right. I got really excited by the name Bob Beacons. All right. Hope you're excited to get working on this. Now, for those of you just jumping in, the best place to get started is at the repository for this application and tutorial, which you can find under my Jacob SN Goodwin handle. And the account application is called Memrizer, or the entire application is called Memrizer. If you scroll down, you'll get an overview of the application, which we'll go over a little bit more next time. But as a heads up, we basically have a Docker Compose development environment that is running traffic, which is a reverse proxy. So if we enter our application's base URL slash API account, we can send post and get requests to this account API application we built last time. This time we're going to build the account client, which was that UI we saw for logging in and updating the user's details. And that will be built with Vue inside of a Docker container. But for this Vue application to work, it will make API requests to API slash account. Therefore, you need to make sure you have this environment up and running and we'll do that now. Fortunately, I've already included a lot of this information in the repository and I've created a tag so if we go up to here and if you, I'll right click and open this at a new tag or tab, you see we have a tag called view and this is the starting point for the view application. So I'm going to open up a terminal now and we're gonna run some of those commands that you see in the readme. So let's maybe open the readme. Let's copy this get clone command and this will clone that view tag. You can use dash dash branch view and then you can use single branch command to get all of the history up to that point or up to the point of that tag as well. So I copy and paste that and I'm gonna put it in a folder called my memorizer. You can leave this out and just use the default folder name, which would be memorizer, but I already have that. <laughs> Good, we can CD into that folder. So my memorizer. And then there is a command to sort of create a master branch from this. And this is actually kind of what is suggested here. You see it says git switch dash C new branch name. And so we'll just create a master branch. So our repository is about ready to go. Let's open this repository up in Visual Studio Code. All right, so here is the repository the main folder you need to look at is this my memorizer folder i set up some workspaces in vs code and so if you want to use the workspace you can use just write code and then the name of this workspace file 
And this just helps with the Go development tools more than anything else. The main thing you'll want to note in this top level folder is that we have an account folder, and this holds the Golang application account API. Also critical is this docker compose.yaml file. This holds the services for our application. We're going to add a view service, but right now it has that traffic reverse proxy, which handles the incoming traffic and either routes it to the API application or the view application. It also holds a Postgres database that is used with the account application, a Redis database used with the account application, and the account application itself. You can see in this that we have some labels and these are used by the traffic container, which was up here under reverse proxy. And this basically says, hey, if I go to malcorp.test, which is the dummy URL we'll be using for this application, more on that soon. And then if I go to API account, so if I go to malcorp.test slash API slash account, then route traffic to this account Docker container. So traffic handles a lot of the Docker, Docker networking under the hood. But to be able to get this malcorp.test to work, the first thing we're going to need to do, and I've already done it, is to update a special file inside of whether it's Mac or Unix or Windows, and that is called the host file. So if I, I'm just gonna use cat to display what's in the host file on my system. If I go to Etsy slash hosts, you can see this file just has individual lines and then it has 127.0.0.1 and then here we have malcorp.test, which is this URL we wanna use. And basically what this does is it maps the anytime we enter malcorp.test into our browser or into Postman, it will map it to localhost or the Docker environment which is running on our machine. Now, if you want to change this in Windows, I'm gonna copy and paste the location. I'm in WSL, which is Windows subsystem for Linux. So you would also need to go to this path, C, Windows, System32, Drivers, etc., or Etsy. And in there, there's a host file, and you would need to add this exact same line. The file looks pretty much the same, so you shouldn't have any trouble with that. The next thing I want to mention here is that we have this make file, and this is useful for getting our database set up. What does this have in it? If we scroll down to the bottom, it has an init command. And what this does is it spins up just the Postgres account container. If you remember in the Docker Compose, let's pull this open again. We had several containers and one of them is Postgres account. So we can actually just open this container instead of running all of the services. And so what we do is open that. Then I, uh, this is not related to Postgres, but I create some RSA key pairs and you can see it takes an environment variable called dev and test we'll see that we're going to create these pairs for creating authorization tokens with JSON web tokens. And we use some of them in a testing environment and we use some of them in a dev environment. Then finally, we have these commands that migrate some database tables to a user's database. And so these migrate up and migrate down commands are contained uh, here. And if you scroll up, you can see we kind of have some paths to find this account application. But if we go to accounts, you see we have a migration folder and you probably don't care about this if you only care about view, but I want you to have a brief understanding of what we're doing. So basically what these do is they execute commands to create a users table with a user ID column, a name, email, password, image URL, and website column. And then you also need to create a down command which allows us to revert changes to our database so we can drop the table. And we also added this UUID-OSSP extension, which allows us to use UUID types for ID columns in Postgres. Anyhow, to run all of this, this is in the My Memorizer folder, and I probably am confusing you by opening this account. This account folder is actually in the My Memorizer this layout is because VS Code won't get its act together with workspaces. It's probably a harder problem than I give it credit. 
All right, so the next thing we need to do, and I just ran this, but let me explain, is you just need to type make init from inside of my underscore memorizer or the root directory of the project. Now you may get some errors here, but let's just see what the output is. We start up the Docker container for the Postgres account and you see it's done. And then we change into the my memorizer folder and we create a RSA256 key pair. And those end up going in the account subfolder actually. And so you see we have these .pem files. And they're grayed out because we also, just to mention, have a git ignore file so you do not check these keys in to your GitHub, for example. Later, we'll also download a service account JSON file, which is also ignored. So we create these two files. Then you see that we had an error here that the Postgres database PQ, the database system, is starting up. So what happened here is that we tried to run these database migrations before the database could actually start up. So there may be a better way to make sure this starts up. A lot of the solutions that I found were very advanced and involved you having to modify the Docker container. So as a ghetto hack solution, you can just run make init one more time. And this time you should get a question saying, all right, are you sure you want to delete all previous migrations? So this is kind of just a command to start with a fresh database. So I do want to run those down migrations, meaning to start with a clean slate. And then it will do the migrate up, which will create the table again. Afterwards, it will stop that account container or Postgres account container. Now, how do we know that these are actually available in Postgres, meaning these tables? What we can do is just run Docker Compose up and then run Postgres account. If you're not as familiar with Docker Compose, please check out the earlier parts of the tutorial. But basically, we have a Postgres Docker image in this Docker Compose development file. And to run this on its own, we can just run Docker Compose up Postgres account. And then I'm going to open some software called PG Admin, which I'll already should have open. And then I'm going to refresh this. This is connected to that database. And if I actually go to properties, you can see that I'm connected to localhost 5432 with the username Postgres. And then when you try to log in, it will probably ask you for a password. And the default password I had to check myself, I'm going to a file where I stored it in the application. The default password is also Postgres. So if we go back to PG Admin, if you're going to connect for the first time, you would go to create connection or server and then you would add a connection. And for connection, you'd enter port 5432, username Postgres, and then password of also Postgres. But as we can see, if we reload this users table here, if I go down to schemas, tables, users, let's go to view, edit, and then all rows. And you can see we have a table with no rows, but the desired columns. So I will control C out of this to stop Docker Compose. Now, you're also going to need a Google Cloud project to be able to run the account application, and that's because we are storing users' photos inside of Google's cloud storage. Now, if you need help creating a Google project, you can just go to cloud.google.com, and since I'm logged in, I can go to console, but you should have the option to sign up here. And after you've signed up, you can follow the instructions, which can be found here at creating slash managing projects or dash managing projects, which will tell you how to create a project, which you can give a unique name. I'd also like to mention that I have a lot of instructions already in getting Google Cloud set up with this application in a previous tutorial, which I'll link in the notes. So after you create this project, there are some fantastic instructions in the documentation for the Google Cloud Storage client library on how to set up permissions for your application. And that article is if you go to the cloud storage client libraries page referenced up here at the top, you can see if you scroll down, there's a nice little button once you've created your Google Cloud project and an account, of course, then you can click this create a service account key page. And what you're going to need to do is create a new service account client or new service account. I already have one called memorizer client. 
So you would add your own, give it whatever name is appropriate, and then you can click Create JSON. And what this will do is allow you to download a JSON file, which we're going to give a specific name. Now I want you to download this file into the account folder of your project. I'll do that now and show you what it looks like. Excellent, I've just downloaded the file. Now, the default name may not be Service Account JSON with a capital A, but that name is very important because in the last project, we set up an environment file with important envir environment variables. And if you go up here to Google Application Credentials, notice something very important that we're referencing a service account.json file. So this name is critical. Now you may be wondering what is this prefix or go source app? And that's because this file gets run from inside of Docker. And so the path actually corresponds to the Docker container and not towards the actual local development path. The next thing you'll need to do is create a cloud storage bucket. Here is the page in Google Docs for creating a bucket and you can just open a cloud storage browser and create a bucket. I'll show you what the bucket will look like once it's created in my console. So to go to Google Cloud Storage, you can usually go here or you could search in the search bar and it's under this storage section. If you followed the instructions about creating a bucket, you should have the name of a bucket here. And now it's also very important that you make all bucket objects public. Also, Google Cloud has an article for making all objects in a bucket publicly readable. So please check this out. That's so that the profile image of your user can be viewed by any other user, although we're not really adding that functionality, but it's the easiest way to create a public image URL readable by the browser. There are more advanced ways, but we're gonna keep it simple. Now, notice that if I go back, I created a bucket called Memrizer Profile Images. This name must be unique across all Google Cloud projects. And so you'll have to create one of a different name, but I recommend you give it something like this, profile images and whatever you like. And this will have to be added as well to this environment file that sets environment variables for the account application. So what you're going to do is set this GC image bucket equal to the name of your particular bucket. The rest of these are not critical. We created these two files already with our make init command. And so at this point, you should be able to run your application. Now I know this is very tedious, but this is a tutorial about creating, you know, microservice type applications that can run in Docker containers. So we have to do it. I can't just create a JSON web server and write to a text file. With all this set up, let's cross our fingers inside of our Z shell. We should now just be able to type Docker compose up and we don't enter a specific service name. We want to run all of the applications that we have. Okay, so our Go application is downloading its dependencies within Docker and we'll probably fast forward a little. All right, after what seems like a million logs, one that's very important is this account log which shows that our account application is up and running and it shows that we have these API endpoints working. Let's go ahead and try one. Now this is actually a separate application than the one I demoed earlier. So let's actually sign up a user. Uh, this time it's not Bob01, it's Guy01. So let's sign up Guy01. And great, we have tokens, so this is looking swell. And then we're going to sign in. Guy01 as well with the same password. Excellent, our API should be ready for use with our view application. Again, apologies for this tedious tutorial, but it's necessary if you want to join in late in the tutorial. As a reminder, all of these instructions were in the GitHub repository. The only part that maybe is a little complex is this Google Cloud key configuration because you have to go to some external documentation. Next time, we'll get going on setting up a view application inside of its own development container and accessed through the traffic reverse proxy. Hasta pronto, pues.